questions. Um, we've been really well introduced, so we can skip skip on. Yeah. Um, so we first thought we'd just uh, share a little bit about who Stace are and what we do. So essentially, Stace are a leading multidisciplinary construction and property consultancy, delivering our services across the UK in various sectors. We have 13 core sectors. Those are listed above. We have five offices. We have 27 partners. We have over 60 years independent trade. Uh, over 200 staff and five core service divisions, namely project management, cost management, building surveying, development monitoring, and health and safety. Our officer locations are in Leeds, Birmingham, Cambridge, Epping, London. And there is uh, some of our clients um, that we're working with at the moment. So a lot of the work that you're look the work that you're going to see today has been come about from the work that we're working work that we're doing with re london and circuit for those of you who don't know re london is a partnership of the mayor of london and london's boroughs to improve waste and resource management in the capital and accelerate the transition to a low carbon circular city circuit is a consortium of 31 organizations of which re london is one of them across four cities, London, Copenhagen, Hamburg and the Helsinki region, who are working together on Horizon 2020 funded circular construction in regenerative cities circuit project. The aim of the project is to reduce the yearly consumption of virgin raw material by 20 percent in new construction and show cost and show cost savings of 15 percent. In terms of uh, the, the work that's been done on re, uh, Circuit and Re-London, that's been concluded now and that's actually available um, online to review if you're interested. So Circuit London and uh, the Circuit London project and STACE. Circuit London, through nine demonstrator construction projects, have been exploring the impact of three innovative intervention areas. Urban mining and reserve, reverse cycles, which is the reuse and recycling of materials extending building life through transformation and refurbishment, designing for disassembly and flexible construction, which makes the previous two interventions easier in the future. And states have been applying life cycle, states have been appointed to apply life cycle cost analysis to assess the impact of the above interventions from a whole life cost perspective. So life cycle cost analysis, uh, what is this? So life cycle costing is the analysis for each component, the capital cost, to determine the cost of maintenance and replacement over a building's lifetime. The periods for replacement are set using standard guidelines, which depend on the building's usage. For example, there are different standard life expectancies between residential and office buildings. Costs are typically analysed over a 50 or 60 year life cycle on MOD projects, for example. For circuit, however, we decided to use a 30 year and a 60 year life cycle, and that was dependent on whether or not it was a meanwhile use. The life cycle cost analysis is undertaken on a net present value basis. So what that means is costs on a current day rates and as such do not factor in any potential future reductions or economies that may be realised from future technology changes or alternative methods of construction. But it does factor in operational and renewal costs. So the future maintenance and replacement costs are then discounted back to establish a current day value. The discount rate itself is based on HM Treasury's Green Book. So the principle of discounting is to allow the life cycle of differing options to be brought back to a comparable time base, i.e. current day values. So on circuit, Stasis input, we undertook life cycle cost analyses for the demonstrator projects to understand the impact on the whole life cost that the interventions will have had. So we tailored our life, standard life cycle template to suit the specific requirements of the circuit brief. So for each demonstrator option, we would carry out two life cycle cost analyses. The first being the baseline scenario. So the life cycle cost using standard or typical construction techniques to establish a business as usual case. 
And then the second life cycle cost was rerun, but using the, the uh, proposed sustainable intervention measures and to see what the impacts that has had. So this allowed the baseline and intervention life cycle cost to be compared on a like for like basis so that we could prove or disprove how effective the interventions were. So whilst we said there was nine demonstrator projects, um, we felt that the best example to demonstrate how our life cycle costing analysis was used is for the design for disassembly demonstrator, which is Albion Street. Albion Street is a meanwhile use, so it is utilised in undeveloped land uh, whilst long term development plans are advanced. The particular site that we're looking here, here has a 10 year lease on the land and the building will have to be removed at the end of the term and relocated to another location. In terms of the life cycle cost analysis, in this instance, it was based on 30 years. So given the 10 year lease, it would be require another two relocations. The project was designed and constructed to enable disassembly and reconstruction on a similar site where the life cycle can be extended. The project demonstrates the process of constructing, deconstructing and reconstructing utilising structural insulated panels um, which have been used to construct the roof and the walls. The study compares against the business as usual scenario, which is a traditional new build construction. In this case, it's assumed to be traditional steel frame with a low tech timber rain screen cladding as opposed to the unitized system. Here are some slides to try and show you how that building um, was to be constructed and how it looked. Just leave that there for a second so you can have a yep. quick. I mean, it's, it's one of the things with this building is it sat on existing foundations, so it didn't yeah. need new foundations. Yeah, one of the uh, one of the, the the project brief elements was that it didn't need new, new foundations and wouldn't weigh any more than the original use. And the whole point is that you can, with meanwhile offerings, you often get a situation where the, the primary buildings have been demolished down to ground floor slab level, leaving um, a space that can be then used for a, for a use such as this. So in terms of the, the results of the life cycle costing, um, what we found were the, was that there was a 6% increase in the capital construction cost for design for disassembly compared to a business as usual case. It had a reduced operational cost of 5%. Um, design for disassembly actually reduced the maintenance cost by 13%, but the biggest uh, saving is on the renewal costs at the end of the 10 year lease. Uh, which showed a 60% reduction. So overall, it's showing over the life cycle that costs were 20% better on design for disassembly, and that's using a 3.5% discount factor uh, to bring it back to current day costs. So another way, the economic analysis can be shown there. So the business as usual case is on the left hand side with the intervention case on the right hand side. So what that's showing is there is a minor uplift in initial capital cost, but the benefit over the whole life of the building is significantly increased um, and could be highly beneficial for sites designated meanwhile use or similar applications. Um, the project also did a carbon analysis as well as cost. Um, and similarly, this demonstrates that there's an initial uplift in embodied carbon, which is offset when reused over multiple cycles. After the first redevelopment, there is a 30% saving in the whole life embodied carbon compared to a business as usual case. But after the second development or redevelopment, this cycle um, increases to a further 46% saving. So to look at it differently, um, you can see there on the first iteration on the left hand side, there is an extra capital cost but the total savings are starting to be realised during the second iteration. And obviously for the third, it will be even better again. Um, and the final point I think on this is return on investment is actually calculated differently to typical industry norms. So what you're looking at, a typical industry norm would be to take 
the, the profit and divide it by the capital cost. What we're doing on um, this particular project is to take the saving that's realized over time compared to a baseline scenario and dividing it by upfront investment. And what that means is it's the extra cost for design for disassembly. So what that producing is Albion Street over two cycles is shown a 17% improvement and over three cycles increases to 25%. So the outcome of the return on an investment uh, in this context provides recommendations for upscaling and implementing regenerative uh, potential. Well, okay. And that, and that's that concluded. We we felt that we'd just do the one demonstrator project um, that was most easily understood in terms of what we were applying the lifestyle capacity and analysis to. So, over to you. If there's any questions. Thank you, thank you, Nick and Glenn. That was very. Uh... Very good presentation. Yeah, uh, happy to take any questions, um, either either on the chat or if any of you want to ask anything here. Julia. Yeah, thank you for that. That was um, that was really interesting, and it's a subject that I'm completely unfamiliar with. So um, it was especially interesting to me, but also slightly mystifying. Um, I I wondered um, because because some of it went by quite quickly for someone who was unfamiliar. Um, did you say that after in the first cycle the carbon emissions were actually more? Yes, there was an increase uh, for the embodied carbon for the first. Um, uh, sort of construction of the design for disassembly. But okay, of course, when um, you come to take it apart sure. and reuse it, that's where you get your significant savings. Yeah, yeah. No, no. I thought that was impressive, but I, I, I'm just more curious. I guess I'm surprised that even in the first cycle, there would be a higher embodied carbon because I guess I think of um, DFD buildings as being quite lightweight and so I would have thought that even in the first circle there might be less embodied carbon. Is, is there is there any particular reason for that in this case or, or do you have any comments about that? So, um, well we, when we were looking at it it was more about the design for being more robust to cope for the disassembly and reconstruction so the components have to be stronger in that regard to enable that onward Recycle, yes. yeah, yeah. And then when you so you say there's a 30 year lifetime, is there is that based on um, any actual knowledge of how many cycles? Like, is it reasonable to assume that after three cycles you would not be able to go on to a fourth cycle, or that was just an assumption that you made? Because it was a, that was the assumption that circuit took just take for the 30 years, but certainly there would be scope to do future further um recycle um or remove moving uh, of the same building but you would probably have to could think about some additional work that would have to be done to the fabric in the same way um so so you would probably need to do a bit more work to it because it will get a bit tired after the first two iterations so yeah. it, it would have to you'd have to put some more carbon back into it or some uh, additional capital cost. That's right. Yeah. yeah, and I guess each building has to look, has to be identical. There, there's no potential really for reconfiguration. It, each the, of the first three cycles, they're all the identical building on a pre-existing foundation. Yeah, that that was the assumption. Yes. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah. No, I, I, that was really interesting. So. Uh, Duncan. I think you were the last question of the office comes from the NFBC. You've got a 30 year or 10 year lifespan of the, the structure. When it comes to be demolished or not, sorry, dismantled, there's going to be a lot of degraded materials that have to be replaced, I've thought, over that period of time. I might have missed the percentage, but there's going to be a lot of new materials need to be added for the rebuild because of what's been lost over time through. You know whether whether it's degraded in time or the it's not doesn't meet the code of practice in that time of being re-erected. Was there any sort of percentage on that? Obviously, that increases your carbon. But what did you have a thought about that? Well, in just to just to give you a bit more explanation on the scenarios. So we've we've limited the cycles to two, which we've discussed. In terms of the fit out, it was assumed as a basic level of fitting out 
with strip lighting and power of vision toilets. It was a basic fit out for both iterations. So obviously, when you're disassembling these and reassembling them, there is less to have to be put back into it. But certainly your assumption, you're certainly you're right. There will be some uh, loss that you'd have to put back in. Yeah, so yeah, I could say there was no um, applied finishes uh, because we assume that the make, you know, that that uh, sort of replacement and carbon would be the same for both options. So it's really, you know, a concrete versus a timber suspended floor versus a concrete floor. So obviously, in in all of these options, we're assuming we can reuse the foundations in the same way. I don't know that's theoretical, but um, if yeah. it was the same assumption for both. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I think we had Faya uh, had her hand up and then Mohammed. Faya? Hello. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you for that presentation. I found it very intriguing. And um, one of the things that I, I, I was really interested in is about the demand for these and how that would feature into sort of the economics of it. Because the sort of upscaling of the production and what they would be used for, these types of buildings. So you're saying they're meanwhile buildings. So my immediate thought they were like sophisticated uh, porter cabins. Um, but so what would they be used for? Where is the land well, that they're going to go on in these temporary leasing arrangements? And um, yeah, so. And then the moving on and the agreements between the first lease and the second lease and the third lease, um, the different contracts there. So there's a few questions, but they all came up. OK, so so I mean, when when we were looking at this, certainly meanwhile is very, very. Um, it's, it's become very, very popular. For example, we're working on Meridian Water, which is a circa 85 hectare site. And there is a significant amount of meanwhile uh, strategy that's being devised at the moment. And you will look at where the pockets of land that you're developing now versus where you're going to be in 10 years time. And then there's going to be a lot of land in 10 years time that's not being utilised for anything. So it could be for a community initiative. It could be to provide worker accommodation. It could be to um, to provide um, a hub for the community. So there's lots of uses that meanwhile can do that can ultimately attract people to a development site and utilise land that's being undeveloped until in the future um, it will be redeveloped. So obviously there's with meanwhile you want to be safeguarding against your um, ability to develop that in the future. So you're only looking at small sections of time, hence the 10 year lease on this piece of land. Um, I was going to say at, at Enfield, I mean, you've, you've done all kinds of projects down there on meanwhile, haven't you? Yeah. Sort of, you know film studios or yeah so there's lots lots of meanwhile land uh, lots of meanwhile uses for it um i mean this particular project is down in rotherhide isn't it mm -hmm. which is it was a piece of land that's not going to be developed for a period of time whilst they decant and sort of so mm -hmm. um so your, your other questions were about the contract and leases i, I guess each one would have to be its own standalone contract. Yeah, yeah. Oh, look, so the, there was another the, question you had. Yeah, the landholder, uh, they're the, they're the beneficiaries here, I guess, because it's sort of if you have land and you're you you've got planning permission, you've got planning permission on that land, then you can use mm -hmm. those meanwhile land, make money out of that, and delay the yeah. con construction of a long long term building. Well, it, it it might not be delaying construction. It might be that you are having to do it in a considered development program. So you will not, you, you can't develop everything. There's cost impact, there's planning impact to, to you can't develop any, everything on some, some of these big sites all at once. So certainly it enables you to get a use for a site that isn't going to be developed and it saves it just sitting dormant and being as, and possibly being as, for example, a security risk or, uh, or something like that. But and, and an income coming in as well for yeah i mean one of the things that i saw with this this particular project the savings are significant the, the more iterations you do and certainly where i see it is worker accommodation 
for key workers where we're as a as a country we are struggling with that at the moment similar buildings could be constructed for this type of purpose where you could utilize undeveloped land move them around for in and be able to dismantle it re-erect re it and and do something that that could be commercially um advantageous because of the number of recycles you can do it so it should be this what we're what i think hopefully circuit will do is make that a folk a um a point for um discussion to open up the discussion on it because it's certainly showing the from the life cycle costing analysis perspective um something that we should all be looking at as developers or landholders um i'll just go back to duncan's question earlier we assumed in our calculations a five percent loss in disassembly and five percent loss in wear and tear for embodied carbon that would have to be put back that's, that's quite small isn't it that's quite good the, the only yeah. reason I ask is obviously some of our members are looking at these three new schools that are both together and supposed to be repurposed afterwards. And obviously they failed miserably because they're not actually going to be lived in or used. And when it comes to mm. actually, uh, and bear in mind, these are brand new properties, boxes, whatever you want to call them, is that the waste in it is actually envisaged to be far greater than, than that at the moment, just because of false ceilings and all sorts of stuff put in. So if you've envisaged 5%, mm. that's pretty good. But from our... Yeah. The reason I ask it is from 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 our historic way of working with things that are supposed to be able to be repurposed. It, the loss has been immense, um, and it's not the demolition that's caused it. It's just the fact that times change, the way things are recycled has changed, the way things um, are accepted in new builds have changed. So therefore, you know, uh, naturally they, it becomes waste. Um, so yeah, five percent. Yeah. I think it's quite. If you can if you can maintain five percent, that's that's fantastic. Mohammed. Hi, sir. Thank you, Ramia. Thank you very much indeed, Glenn and Nick, for this really interesting presentation. Um, my question relates to the case studies of the circuit project. Um, so what were the lessons learned, the differences between the different case studies? And which leads to the second question, which is, what do you think the uh, uh, differences are between the types of buildings in terms of LCC? Say, for example, housing, versus commercial or different types of construction techniques, i.e. off-site versus uh, traditional construction techniques? Well, um, so take the first one first. So of the demonstrated projects, I think one of the things that was very obvious to Glenn and I after doing the uh, some of the calculations on it was we looked at a home-based home project which was never constructed for design for disassembly. Um, but we looked at the merits of um, dismantling and re-erecting as a complete building um, on another site. So on a building that hadn't been designed for disassembly. The, the structure lent itself to it, it certainly lent itself to doing it, but the analysis that the economic analysis that we did on it, despite really wanting it to work, it didn't work. It just we shouldn't make it work from a cost perspective. Um, that said, um, we thought that the margins were fairly tight and that it was something that we shouldn't lose sight of in the future to try to keep doing some stuff like that, because it was heavily dependent on the steel scrap values at the time, which are, were going up and down. And um, also the techniques, the construction techniques to enable the dismantling from a dis demolition perspective needed to be a bit more further advanced and i think once you get more and more companies uh, demolition companies getting involved with this then it will become more normal um so certainly that was that was yeah, so we, we, we looked at both um dismantling it and using it it was built in sections so there was a central spine and seven equal sections down each side whether you could use part of it all of it and then we also looked at sort of whether you could repurpose the steel Mm. And as Nick said, we we just couldn't the, the the market rates were just such that we couldn't get it to work look, look. and make it worthwhile. So the premium for repurposing the steel was outweighed by the cost of of salvaging it. Yeah. So it was, but it was very fine line between it, and certainly we wouldn't preclude us from trying to explore that on any future projects. Yeah, but but I assume, I assume that challenges were were there because most of the buildings, if not all, 
were not designed for this assembly. That's correct. That's yeah. the that's that's the issue. So we were looking at that as one of the demonstrator projects to understand whether we could do it and whether we should right. be pushing that further. But it was certainly down to the not we we met with quite a lot of demolition companies to to understand what they're doing, how they're approaching it, um, what their reuse cycle looked like by as as normal, how it would all work, and certainly the the extra cost for doing it just made it um unattractive economically but if you had um, an intervention from the gla or the councils and saying you need to do more with it then perhaps it will fit it will drive a um a demolition companies to look at it more yeah uh, so, so i mean demolition companies normally give you just a bottom line price with a little bit of a <laughs> breakdown so what we were doing was actually finding out how much scrap value they're factoring in and then working with them to see if we could get these things to work. Mm. So you had a project at um, Meridian Water where they, they challenged a demolition contractor, for example, to salvage about 4,000 bricks by taking it down more carefully. So there's a bit of a premium. Yeah. And in the end, uh, to everybody's surprise, I think it was 19,000 bricks got 19, salvaged. 000. Yeah. So it's things like that. Without paying a, a huge, without paying the earth for it, I was going to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. And there was a second question you had, Mohammed. Part of it. About the types, yeah, the types of, uh, do you think there's a difference between the types of buildings, i.e. Um, housing or residential versus commercial, and the type of construction techniques, for example, of site versus on site? I think, I think um, housing and, um, for example, that uh, Albion Street, those sort of buildings lend themselves to it. I think it's probably a bit more difficult with commercial office and stuff like that would make it more difficult. The bigger the building, it wasn't. It wasn't. So the before states were involved, they'd already selected the nine demonstrators, so it wasn't an option to look at mm -hmm. one of those. We did look at a cut and carve building to create some residential, mm -hmm. and if, how we could sort of retain more of the structure and and what the compromises would be. So that was another. That was quite a complex. We didn't we didn't put this on the on the on the didn't use that as an example on this presentation which was quite complicated it's, it's, it wasn't an easy read through and we were trying to to do something that would demonstrate you, how life cycle costing was not used rather than that which would make yeah. it more difficult yeah and it, it would have been tricky to try and explain all the the, the, the sort of uh, variables variables of or, the, or the bits the factors so you know basement sizes changed and things like that to, to make it work that's good thank you uh, I think Duncan and then uh, sorry me again apologies um it was only to say <clears throat> comment off of that uh, if any London demolition company can salvage bricks they will uh, for the simple reason is they're worth a lot of money so bricks in London are, are worth a lot of give back not so much in anywhere else in the country but there's I don't know yeah. sorry I missed the dates in which you did this structure and your and your exercise uh, I do apologize for that um but what's it's changed dramatically in the last nine to 12 months because I don't know who and obviously I don't know who the demolition contractors you're working with but there's a lot of buildings in in London at the minute being used as donor structures for um, mm -hmm. new builds so therefore they're taking obviously redundant steel work and rather than obviously taking it to a scrap yard they're repurposing it into into the into the the new builds and I was at an ASBP presentation not long ago where it actually was cheaper on that particular project to use donor material, um, which surprised me unbelievably that that was the case. Um, so it, it's changing quite a lot, actually. So over the last probably nine to 12 months, I would say that the way in which steel, especially with people like EMR and CSG and all these people are now using resized material and people are willing to put some sort of quality assurance to it. I think you're seeing a lot more reuse of steel work um, at a better rate than you are in scrap. So, you know, a lot most demolition firms, yes, yeah, scrap is great because you can chop it down and send it in. But I think now the reward is coming through that one, it's a great impact on the or lesser impact on the environment. It's a great thing for, for all businesses. There is obviously a financial reward for doing it, which is which is obviously a leader for most things. But I have I am seeing a lot of changes. So I apologize if I didn't know when you did this, but I would say in the last six months at least, there's a lot of donor buildings being used now for, for reuse and repurposing of steel work. In a, in a, no, in a no, great 
we, no, we agree with you, Duncan, on that. I mean, we we we've actually doing it at Meridian Water. We we've just done it recently on a, on um, some um, um, portal frame structures. So it, yeah. we, I agree with you. It's doing it, but it it really does depend on the building, and yes, also does, yeah. the yeah. Uh, the the uh, how safely you can uh, mine those materials, which yeah, can agreed. drive the cost up. So it depends on what type of building it is. But certainly, I agree with you. It is happening more and more. Yeah. Um, I mean, the benefit at Meridian is you have land to store those materials as well once they're salvaged. Yeah. Mm. Um, and then, you know, the, there is a, a huge sort of um, discussion happening with Enfield and a, a circular forum regarding the sort of yeah, certification I mean, of these uh, the materials as well afterwards. Yeah, I mean, it always comes down to, and we're slightly digressing now, but it always comes down to time, um, making sure that the donor and recipient buildings are aligned with their programming, that the yeah. pre-demolition audits are being undertaken well in advance of yeah. the um, the buildings being designed so that you can take that. Uh, and as Glenn said, is about the, the, key, the key issue is, is storing them. Admittedly, EMR do some really good stuff. They can take it away. They'll probably pay probably, at the time we looked at some of these, they were paying about 10, between 10 and 20% more than scrap for sections that were salvaged properly. Yeah. Um, um, and then that came down to the specification that was being developed to make sure that the specification for the demolition company was clear on how they had to be mined. Yeah. And then um, they, they're able to re-warrant it and, and bring it back down, um, bring it back to site or give it to another site. So we are familiar with EMR and um, uh, Cleveland Steel, etc. Yeah. yeah, I think what you've done is fantastic. It's good. Um, another question from Fea? Yeah, thanks very much. Um, I was wondering, because you were part of the circuit project, which obviously had um, operations, you know, research going on <clears throat> in Copenhagen and other cities in Europe. And I just wondered if there were different methodologies adopted by um, the consultants and <clears throat> academics and partners involved in those processes that were using life cycle cost analysis. and did they come out with different outcomes, you know, like, for example, using a different uh, discount rate? Because you, you said that you use basically the um, UK Treasury Green Book rate. So I just was wondering if you, you know, through the engagement with that, that project, the EU project, that you've got insights of other approaches and other outcomes. Well, we we actually uh, presented to the circuit and all the other cities on it uh, about what we were doing, life cycle costing analysis. I don't think they actually did that kind of economic analysis on their um, projects. They focused on slightly different demonstrator um, variances. So I think we were the only city doing the actual life cycle costing analysis. So uh, given I mean, the... You... Yeah, sorry, I was just thinking, so given that you're the only ones, were people... So, you know, impressed by your outcomes and 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 did, do you think there's other initiatives taking forward um from it well we'd like to think so um it's been we have presented on it uh the the research was concluded i think in november where it was issued for um it was published uh, in, in november yeah, yeah. um um well, i haven't had any specific feedback from from them but that's not to say rerun them themselves haven't had that so reland we were working for re-london on it yeah the, you, you're, you're right insofar as the value of say timber in holland will be different to the uk so they're, they're mm. likely to have had differing results i know holland you know holland are doing a lot of work on this thanks for it. are there any more questions um from anyone before because we we, uh, we still have five minutes time um as per the original plan but if there is but if there are no more questions then uh we can everybody can get five minutes back thank you thanks again um glenn and nick uh for taking all the questions and for the excellent presentation and uh yeah if anybody would like to get in touch um please feel free to do so after this uh the, the webinar um otherwise uh, have a nice afternoon everyone and see you next month thank you okay, thank you thank you very much thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.